between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, This is part of the Prosper Show e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. They have an awesome conference with some of the top Amazon sellers and industry leaders like we have Michael today. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps service professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, coaches, create additional revenue streams and stop just trading time for dollars. We hold you accountable to achieve your biggest goals with a step-by-step roadmap. Go to Rise25.com to learn more. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran. Today, I'm very excited. We have Michael Anderson. He's finally healthy and kicking. He's co-founder of Etail Solutions. They are a multi-channel commerce solution for high-volume merchants. Etail Solutions has a platform, a platform which provides high-volume merchants with a tool set, and the tool set includes online sales channel automation, order management system, global pricing and repricing controls, supplier integrations, product catalog management, and data warehouse reporting. If you have no idea what these things are, you are not a fit for Etail Solutions. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, really Etail Solutions is focused on driving efficiency. So what they do is they allow businesses to scale without having to add staff or increase expenses because their platform does the heavy lifting. Right, Michael? I think that's fair to say, yeah. So the fun fact about Michael is he has twins. One, a boy, girl, twins. So, Michael, thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely. Happy to be here. Yeah, Michael, you were talking about trends, and um, you see a lot of sellers. I'm curious of what you see some of the biggest mistakes that they're making. Uh, You know, at the core of the core, uh, if I can say it that way, The ability to scale in a multi-channel world is, as I mentioned before, it's all about the catalog and it's all about inventory management. Yeah. Um, A really simplistic example would be, okay, so let's say that I've got 10 units of this pen um, and I've got, let's say, uh, three Amazon listings and an eBay listing and a website listing. So that's five different listings for a single SKU. The question comes down to, well, what do I what do I publish to each of those? Do I publish 100% of what I have? Because if so, I just told the world I've got 50 when I've only got 10, right? So dealing with the concepts and giving people the tools to be able to, to do partial allocations to individual listings or channels, doing mins and maxes, giving them the tool set to be able to deal with that is important. But inventory management tends to be the... Uh, the gateway conversation, if you will, that a lot of people bring to us. And, and when you ask them, well, what's your major pain point? What problem are you trying to solve? They'll start with inventory management. But inventory management is a, the problem of inventory management is a symptom of so much, uh, uh, so many other pieces of the organization. Right. Because sales orders, right. deplete inventory, purchases, bring up inventory, transfers, adjustments, Um, shrinkage, all those different things affect your inventory. So you kind of have to have visibility on the sales side and the purchasing side, as well as basic inventory management capabilities in order to do that effectively. And then you got to also deal with all the challenges of selling across these different channels. So um, I would say that, yeah, inventory is is probably the biggest issue that they come to us with. Yeah, because I would think that um, like you said, there's a lot of different issues that can come about. Well, if you don't sell, sell fast enough, then you're sitting on all this inventory and yeah. then you have to manage more. But then let's say you get uh, a bunch of sales instantly. Now you got to you know, put in capital yeah. to buy it. Yeah. Yeah. I, we've seen a number of you. So you ask about sort of merchant mistakes. We've seen a number of scenarios where people have gotten out over their skis and, and had poor inventory management practices. Uh, they think just because it's a high moving skew that they should buy, mm. you know, a container load of something. They projected uh, it and then they just then, bought too much. Well, and it might even be a fast moving product, but if you're tying up your cash for eight months before you get a return on that cash, you know, you got to pay, you got to make payroll, you got to pay your utilities, you know, all those other things. And we've just seen a number of folks just get um, 
uh, too much of their cash tied up in inventory and it cripples their business. So knowing what to buy and how much to buy and how frequently to buy uh, is, is a critical component as well of being successful and being able to scale. Oh, yeah. Um, there was another case. Uh, I want you to talk about a few uh, interesting stories, uh, case studies. Um, okay. And there was a husband and wife, I think, that came to you. And I don't know if it was their motto. It was like never own inventory. Uh, that was, was actually it? a different customer. Oh, that was different. They, oh, okay. I mean, they, they fit that mold, quite frankly. So uh, it's a company called Olivabel, actually, and we've done a, a case study, and he's okay with us using his name. Um, and you can Google it. Uh, there's, there was kind of a, a heartwarming story about how he got started, and Amazon did a case study on him. You know, he uh, was affected by Hurricane Katrina way back when and, uh, and started drop shipping on Amazon to support his family and the business started growing. And, and Olivabelle is actually the name, it's a combined combination of his two daughters' names. Mm. Uh, so nice. heartwarming story, but he came to us and he was doing about, um, well, he was doing about 65K or so um, and uh, uh, a month in sales. And he was doing all of this via just manual order management. He was drop shipping from one major supplier and getting the file and massaging it, uploading it to, to Amazon and doing that a few times a day right. and then dealing with 50, 60 manual purchase orders every single day and then getting tracking information and trying to put it up there. So um, we, when we engaged, he not a lot of automation, that, no, none. And so he recognized that he needed to kind of make an investment in that uh, area, but the, based on his size, it was kind of a big deal for him to make that investment. Um, but we, what we did is we, so we integrated the catalog, so we automated the price and availability feed. Uh, we integrated the supplier; they they could work with EDI, so we've got a fully functional EDI subsystem, so we can deal with the the purchase orders and receiving the tracking information back. We automated a lot of the the matching and the publishing out to the different out to Amazon at the time was the only place he was selling. Turned on repricing, gave him access to our matching tool at the time. And um, all of a sudden, so instead of spending four to six hours doing manual POs every day, he didn't have to worry about any of the order management, just the exceptions. And so he just turned into an animal um, going out there and matching the listings. So the supplier had a fairly good sized catalog and he would go out and he'd find four or five, six mm. listings, you know, not just matching on UPC, but matching on description. And, and he just he just really expanded his his uh, catalog. So and his he listings can, that compared to what what was being sold on Amazon currently. Yeah, he would. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So he would just match to that. Um, you know, you fast forward a few years and uh, he's got many different suppliers that are integrated now. He's selling on Amazon, Canada and eBay. Um, and um, just recently, uh, he just celebrated his first million dollar month. So wow. um, and it's just uh, he uh, he is him as his wife and I think another halftime person. So two and a half people are running that business. Wow. So it gave him the time to really increase the number of listings and increase the channels as well, mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So there's another person, and um, they went from they were doing ninety, uh, almost a hundred thousand a month, mm -hmm. and now I think you said they were doing six and a half million. Um, I'm, what did they do to grow? I know you can't talk about the specifics about this person because they didn't give you approval, but what yeah. what were some of the things that they did uh, to actually grow? Yeah, so yeah, they were start they started out with us at ninety five k a month, and um, as you said, they're they're doing between six and a half and seven million a month at this point. Oh. Um, I can't even talk about the industry because it's a it's a highly they're, competitive right. space that they're <laughs> they're in all and, highly uh, competitive. No one wants to talk uh, about the industry. Yeah, nobody. Well, and that's funny because we get the down low high five all the time of you know considered we're considered kind of a secret weapon and people don't want to talk about it so right. it's kind of a backhanded right compliment. it's interesting because how do you generate referrals when people obviously they don't want to tell the competition about you yeah but we honestly we've fallen behind in really trying to do that until just recently we're starting to do um more case studies and, and some folks are willing to use their name other folks are, are willing to say you know go ahead and use all the data just you know keep me anonymous and right. uh but we'll, we'll do what we can but yeah, in this case, because um, six and a half million per month is yeah, serious volume. Yeah, yeah, um, and that's taken him. You know, that was probably about four, four and a half years or so um, that he's grown to that with us. Uh, you know, it's a lot of things. Um, there's um, there's quite a bit of cross. So so we deal with multiple fulfillment methods. Um, so 
you know, a certain amount of stuff is in stock and they can ship from stock. A lot of times in order to grow to that size, you really need to expand your catalog offering. And so you want to leverage your supplier's inventory. So that can involve uh, setting up drop shipping relationships or it can involve cross stocking, which is essentially kind of ordering on demand. So you can leverage your supplier's inventory, get a price and availability feed, publish that inventory for sale. Then when the orders happen, you can kind of queue those up through the day, do a bulk PO to the supplier. They ship you the goods the next day, you send it to the end customer and we mm-hmm. built some some very efficient tool sets to do that. So he started leveraging his supplier's inventory. And then as FBA started to get more and more popular, um, he, uh, to his credit, has, has built a phenomenal team around him to really uh, dig into what products make sense to go deep on. And in some so ways- So he may test them with like leverage supplier inventory before putting up a bunch of capital, then see exactly. which ones actually sell volume. And then those ones, he'll invest the capital and ship them to FBA and increase the- the volume on them essentially you nailed it you nailed it and we're, we're seeing a lot more of that um now where people that's really smart to, to, well it is i yeah. mean you get you get access you're to just testing books. without yeah, putting testing. up any money now the, the only downside to that is is that um if you if you only focus on that from the perspective of what's moving what am i selling that can be a little bit of a misnomer because if you're drop shipping your cost basis is not going to be as low as if you are buying in bulk and sending to fba sure um, so, but that's the price you uh, pay for testing and not putting up capital, right? But you have to look at it this way. Look, if I'm able to do a, quite a bit of volume on these hundred SKUs and I'm drop shipping, what more could I do if I had that at, at FBA and how much right. more money could I make? Yeah. So, you know, I would say for him, it's a combination of really growing his catalog with a number of supplier integrations, um, focusing on leveraging FBM fulfillment in all of its different forms in order to do multi-ace and matching um, but then doing smart sourcing and really taking advantage of sort of the FBA bandwagon uh, and all the benefits yeah. that that can bring. Yeah. So, Michael, um, again, you see a lot of companies, a lot of trends. I'm curious if you see something, whether it's a product that no one else is doing right now, that you, um, you it's maybe like if you were in the space of being a seller, if you were to give away an idea, um, what would you say, like no one's executing on this necessarily, so you're not giving away anything in particular, but like I think I have this really good idea for this, whatever it is, because I'm sure you are, um, your creative juices are always like kind of bubbling in your head. Are there any um, ideas that you can give away that none of your sellers who are on your platform are actually selling now that you think would be uh, interesting to test on the market? You know, there's uh, honestly nothing really comes to mind. I I would tell you if it did, but you know, our sellers, our our product was built in such a way that it's not specific to a a niche, as it were. Like, no, I'm just curious. You know, like, yeah, no, you see a lot of things come through your desk, and I'm sure you're like, you know, if there was just this widget, then no one's doing it. But yeah, not yet. I would say though, as a general rule, um, the people that we see are successful. Um, almost always it has to do with a unique strategy around sourcing. Um, I always tell people, you know, mm. we can turn on sale with, with repricing engines and so forth. You can turn on sales like a spigot these so, days with yeah. the right platform, but it's how you buy and what makes you unique in your supply chain that ultimately allows you to scale yeah. the business. Yeah. So that's interesting. Unique, yeah. Unique manufacturers, uh, in products that, you know, when people need them, they really need them. So maybe some long tail stuff, if you can leverage that inventory where it sits versus taking ownership of it. Uh, but now there's there's no individual product that comes to mind, unfortunately. What would be an example of a unique source, a unique sourcing example? Um, we've got a guy who, uh, well, I, it's, man, I got to be careful here. I, I, I don't want to get you in so, trouble. Yeah, no, I, I'm – so things that you might – not necessarily think of as high volume things, uh, you know, uh, tires, uh, and, and not big tires, but like bike tires or, you know, things, things that don't necessarily come to mind when you think about, you know, hot moving products. Let's be honest. There's the, the, especially with the major distributors out there, um, who are in the consumer electronics and office products and so forth, that space is completely saturated. Right. And the margins are just so narrow. Right. But if you can find products that, like I said, when people need them, they really need them. And if you can be the best source of those products, um, you can do a tremendous amount of business. And we've seen some really unique stuff. And I quite frankly, those are kind of the, some of the 
secret sauces of our merchants, so I, I don't think I can really go there. But um, I, I have to ask say, the question, though. You know, yeah, so. no. Just if you're looking for sourcing ideas, I would just say go to local, go to local trade shows where you're going to yeah. run into local manufacturers who may have figured out an awesome little product, but just don't know how to kind of capture and take advantage of right. a global. They haven't gone online type of thing. And negotiate to yeah. be their exclusive distributor. Um, we see that as a trend um, that's that's really picking up some speed, where merchants themselves are positioning themselves as really providing a marketplace management service, and using that, going to the brands directly and just saying, "Hey, look, I know you don't really, maybe aren't capturing Amazon or eBay revenue, or maybe don't have any desire to do that, and you can't because it'll create cut channel conflict with your existing customers." Let us do that for you. And right. it's a one-off transaction. Right. Uh, we'll split the profits. Those types of arrangements, they're happening all the time right now. Uh, and I think it's a great strategy. I think we've mm-hmm. been seeing it work. So that leads me to, so what conferences that you like recommend? Obviously, and we talked about the Prosper Show. What other conferences, e-commerce uh, conferences, or maybe sourcing conferences that you either have attended or you heard are good? Uh, so I will say James and team, uh, the prosper show, they, they, it was a first year show this last year. I thought it was really, really well done. Um, that, uh, so I'm looking forward to going to that one again and, and we'll have a 10 by 20 booth there. Um, you know, we, we go to IRC every single year, uh, in June. It's one of these shows where you kind of just, once you start going, you kind of almost have to be there and, and people expect you to be there. Um, the return on investment is probably iffy one way or the yeah. other. It's a but huge exhibition. I mean, they have like, what, like 800 massive. or 900 um, booths or something? Probably, yeah. Maybe more. Yeah. I, think, I mean, it's thousands and thousands and thousands of people, yeah. um, ranging from, you know, big corporations to individual, you know, sole proprietors. But it's a it's a great place for us to meet with merchants, meet, meet with prospects, meet with a lot of our customers now go to that. So, so we use it in a lot of different ways and, you know, we'll oftentimes, you know, schedule meetings with customers around that and so forth. So, um, that one, we're there, we're at that one every year. Um, that's been a fairly decent show. Um, I've been to a number of other ones, um, over the years. Um, I'll be honest for our particular clients, the people that we work with really well, mm-hmm. um, we're finding other sources of, of uh, getting in touch with those people that are frankly more cost effective than trade shows. So, right. you know, for our, our strategy as a company, we probably will start to lean away from some of, you know, just going to a lot of shows and, and start really focusing more on a couple of specific shows every single year, but then investing our, our efforts in, in getting in touch with merchants in other ways. Yeah. No, Michael, this has been hugely valuable. I appreciate you sharing your insights. I have uh, two more questions, but people sure. should check out etailsolutions.com. Are there any other places we should point them towards online or specifically on your site? Uh, you know, I guess it really just has to do with what their what their needs are. Um, I will say this: we, especially with sort of all of the banging our heads against the wall we've done over the last seven years of learning who we can best serve, uh, we're very transparent with people. If we can help them, um, we'll we'll certainly pursue that. Um, if we're not a good fit, uh, we've got relationships with other providers out there as well, and we've we've certainly referred business to other providers. So if we're not a good fit, if it's too early for us, I'd rather see some people go and be successful with another platform, and then maybe someday work with us yeah. than to have a bad relationship. So, you know, if you've got questions, the best thing I can say is you know certainly read up on us on our site or watch our videos, but just reach out to us, and we'll just have an honest conversation and see if there's a fit or not. Yeah. So check out etailsolutions.com. So first question, Michael, is what have we missed with the Etail Solutions story? We've talked a lot about different <laughs> topics. What uh, have we missed anything? I don't think so. You know, just yeah. like many software companies, you kind of you go through a lot of learning curves as you grow and and stretching the organization. And uh, you know, we're as an organization, we're really investing a lot of time and energy right now in customer success. Um, and customer success is a fairly popular topic in the SaaS industry overall, but um, it's it's really just a change in mindset of, you know, we need to be, instead of being reactive to clients, we really need to be proactive. And so doing things like regular account meetings and, um, and talking about not just, hey, what do you want us to do? Because at that point, we're just executing against the customer's plan, which may work in some scenarios, but asking the question of where do you want to go over the next one to three years? 
and helping, you know, do you want to drive 10% growth next year or 200%? Because we can suggest different services or help you in different ways, dramatic in dramatically different ways than if you want to maintain revenue versus if you want to be aggressively grow. Um, so I would say that's probably the biggest thing that, that we've learned, you know, over the years that we're really focusing on right now is customer success and partnering with our clients. Um, Having get, more you know, specific meetings about yeah. strategy. We've learned, I mean, we've just learned so much about how we can leverage tools and where the opportunities are and so forth. And we've just learned that, you know, as an organization, the merchants that really grow are the ones that we can have that really close working relationship with. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of just in the best scenarios, we're considered just an extension of their team. And, and that really causes a lot of good things to happen. Yeah. Are you seeing, as far as opportunities that you mentioned, you know, obviously there's the Amazons and Walmarts. What are some of the lesser known ones that people should be looking at? Well, um, obviously not lesser known, but you, you mentioned Walmart. I would say that that is that was a huge push this last year and continues to be this year. Um, they're growing very aggressively. Um, it's definitely something if you're not on Walmart, you should really consider trying to figure that out and, and get on Walmart. You know, another thing, um, for the last couple of years, we've been working with the eBay Strategic Merchant Group, which not a lot of folks know about. Mm-hmm. Um, and by definition, that group is looking for merchants who are doing more than a million dollars annually somewhere else on the web. Um, and less than 5% of their sales are based upon eBay sales as of today. Right. And that group is a group of salespeople, which believe it or not is a good thing. Um, and they're tasked with, with sort of re-embracing people who may have been on eBay in the past and were yeah. disenchanted for whatever reason. Um, but that group can do some really phenomenal things. And, and we've been working closely with them over the last year and a half or so. And by definition, see people go from less than 5% of their, their GMV on eBay to sometimes 15, 20, 30% of their total GMV now on eBay because of this group. They can mm-hmm. waive listings in certain categories. They can rapidly raise your selling limits. They can get you involved in deal, daily deal promotions. Um, and so that's been a really good relationship that we find not a lot of people know is out there. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so that's, um, thank you. Yeah, that's good. That's the one. Sure. Love that. So last question, Michael, and I'm always curious about this for uh, selfish reasons too. I'm wondering, um, what your, your schedule looks like and how you, I don't like the term balance family and business cause it's, it's always a tough one, but how do you integrate the family side with the business side? Cause obviously you have a growing company and there's a lot that's involved in the company, but you mm-hmm. have twins um and family too so Mm -hmm. how does that all integrate together what does your schedule look like well uh, you know i've got a fairly interesting story that way and i'll I'll try and be brief but you know uh you know my wife and i had had some trouble having the kids that we did and um we lost a couple along the way and sorry to hear um, that yeah and but ultimately you know we we had the twins um it was a difficult labor they were born at 30 weeks um, after six weeks of hospital bed rest and, Jeez. you know, so, so we got, I mean, God really blessed us. We, we, we've, uh, we've got a boy and a girl. I get to see the differences between boys and girls real time, but you know, we're kind of two and out. And so <laughs> for me, <laughs> yeah. um, for me, it's, it's, I only get one shot at this in terms of raising kids and, and our kids are our legacy. And, right, um, right. and so for me, I've always kind of maintained, uh, that, you know, when it comes to the end of the work day, Whenever the workday sort of naturally wraps up, 5.30, 6, whatever that is, between that time and the time my kids go to bed, I'm off limits. And, you know, I'll, in all likelihood, I'm going to open up my laptop and putz on something after the kids go to bed. But right. that, that one thing, I think, has, has allowed me to maintain some level of balance. Um, I'll be honest, doesn't always mean that mentally I'm present. Sometimes that's a difficult balance to maintain. but. Right. Um, for me that, uh, sort of the, the, the whole experience that we went through with these children and, and the fact that, uh, they're, they're what I've got. Um, and I only get one chance at this. It's not like I've got an older kid and a younger kid and I can do better the second time around. Um, they're th- going at it at the same it. time. So, yeah. Yeah. So that, that really has helped at least provide me some, some perspective as well as, uh, uh you know, my faith is fairly important to me as well. And yeah. so that. That all kind of weighs into it. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's that sounds really difficult, and uh, it sounds like carving that time out between your, you know, when you get back and when they go to bed is 
just the ultimate importance. So, yep. yep. Yep, it is. Michael, thank you. I really appreciate it. And everyone should check out Etail Solutions. It's E T A I L solutions.com. And uh, if anyone's going to the Prosper Show, you should uh, I'll say be there. hi. You'll be there. Team will be there. Etail Solutions will be there. Yep. So, thanks, Michael. Appreciate All it. All right. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate it. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hunt.